Hello, I'm Eric Huang. You're listening to Saint Podcast, a podcast about the always fascinating and often controversial lives of the saints. This is a history and culture podcast that traces the origins of morality tales of the saints, also known as hagiographies, and how they continue to impact life today. This season of Saint Podcast is dedicated to mystics, saints who had transcendental experiences with the divine. Over the next eight episodes, we'll meet saints who had prophetic visions of the future. We'll explore the legend of a nun who suffered from transverberation, literally a burning arrow of love that pierced her heart and entrails. We'll also encounter saints who bore stigmata, the bloody wounds of the crucifixion, and a saint whose heavenly visions led them to victory in battle. Episode 3 in the Mystic series is about a 12th century author, composer, theologian, naturalist, and exorcist. She began life as an oblate, a child who was donated irrevocably to the church, sealed up in a cell till death. How she emerged to become one of the most sought-after advisors to bishops, kings, and popes is incredible, especially so given the stringent restrictions that greatly narrow the possibilities open for women. This is the story of St. Hildegard of Bingen, the mystical polymath. Hildegard of Bingen is the first saint we've explored in St. Podcast, whose life is revealed to us by their own writings. The number of surviving letters and works make Hildegard one of the most prolific medieval writers. Even the main biographical source, her vita, the life of St. Hildegard, contains autobiographical passages dictated by her to Theodoric of Echternach, one of two writers of the hagiography. A second unfinished biography is by Guibert of Jean Bleu, a Benedictine monk who knew Hildegard well. And then there are the missives written by Hildegard herself that contain fragments of her life and experiences. According to all of these sources, which are sometimes contradictory, Hildegard of Bingen was born around the year 1098. Bingen isn't her birthplace. It's the town in the Rhineland region of Germany that has today engulfed the location where her monastery, the Rupertsburg, used to stand. The Rhineland is the same region where the cult of St. Ursula developed. We explored this legend in the Martyrs episode, St. Ursula, the leader of 11,000 virgins. According to Fiona Maddox, author of the excellent book, Hildegard of Bingen, The Woman of Her Age, there is general consensus that Hildegard's birthplace is in Burmersheim, a nearby wine-growing region. Her parents are Mechthild of Merxheim nahet and Hildebert of Burmersheim, minor nobility in the service of the Count of Spanheim. We know nearly nothing about Hildegard's early years. Numerous legends tell of a privileged childhood playing in the shadow of Count Spanheim's castle. What we do know for sure is that Hildegard is a sickly child whose frail constitution is linked to the visions she sees at a very young age. Here's how a 77-year-old Hildegard describes her visions. It comes from a letter she writes to her friend and biographer, Guibert. From my early childhood, before my bones, nerves, and veins were fully strengthened, I have always seen this vision in my soul. In this vision, my soul rises up high into the vault of heaven and into the changing sky and spreads itself out among different peoples. I do not hear them with my outward ears, nor do I perceive them by the thoughts of my own heart or by any combination of my five senses, but in my soul alone, while my outward eyes are open, and I am constantly fettered by sickness, and often in the grip of pain so intense that it threatens to kill me. Unlike divine ecstasies, Hildegard's visions are devoid of the intense orgasmic pleasure experienced by saints like Teresa and Francis, whom we'll meet in forthcoming Mystics episodes. Hildegard experiences only an intense pain that constantly debilitates her. She describes the visions as a reflection of the living light, which is, quote, far, far brighter than a cloud which carries the sun. 
The figures, symbols, and revelations she witnesses are like the stars and moon reflected in water. It's only when Hildegard is six or seven that she realizes she's special. The incredulous, then concerned faces of adults reveal to her that most people do not share her experiences of lucid waking dreams. It's likely Hildegard's frequent bouts of illness brought on by these visions add weight to her parents' decision to vow her to the church as an oblate, a child donated to the church forever. This was a common, though declining, custom at the time for wealthy families to consecrate later or last-born children to the church. The practice is recorded in the 6th century Rule of St. Benedict, guidelines written by the titular saint to govern life in a monastery. In the year 656, about 150 years after St. Benedict's rules were published, the 10th Council of Toledo forbade the donation of children under 10 and also granted oblates the option to leave the monastery when they reached puberty. Adults who chose to withdraw from society to pursue a solitary religious life, but not as a monk or nun, were called anchorites. Unlike hermits, anchorites lived within the confines of a monastery rather than alone in the wilderness. They still lived solitary lives, though physically sealed into a room with access only to provide food and water and to remove waste. That said, the severity of the solitary confinement varied greatly from windowless cells that were essentially prisons to sunlit apartments with several rooms and an unlocked door. The Anchorite trend peaked in the 13th century, particularly in Germany and England, and came to an end in the 16th century with the Protestant Reformation. On All Saints' Day in the year 1112, a 14-year-old Hildegard is enclosed into a cell at a monastery called Disseboudenberg. Joining her is an anchorite named Jutta of Sponheim, a noblewoman in her early 20s whose very wealthy family is acquainted with Hildegard's less wealthy family. Hildegard's own account states she's eight when this happens but recent scholarship suggests 14 is more likely given the minimum age set by the rules of St. Benedict, and also from the account in Utah's hagiography. Be it 8 years old or 14 years old, it's clear from Hildegard's recollections that she doesn't feel ready to leave her family. We don't know exactly how the two girls spend the six years at Spanheim before entering the monastery at Disseboudenberg, but we can guess that religion is at the center of their daily life. Years earlier, a 12-year-old Utah survives a life-threatening illness. She then dedicates herself to God as a result of the miraculous recovery. Religion becomes Utah's primary focus. She yearns to go on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem or Santiago de Compostela. Utah's Vita mentions a woman named Uda who is employed as Utah's religious tutor and probably instructs Hildegard as well. In the year 1110 or 1111, Yuta's mother passes away. Yuta's father had died years earlier, which means Yuta is now a very rich, single woman. Suitors line up for her hand in marriage and for control of her significant holdings. Guibert describes how Yuta deals with all the likely lads. Yuta triumphed over all that would entice and divert her and clasped celibacy vigorously. She wrenched it from her heart so that she might not dally in any way about it. She put up an unflinching resistance to all the base-minded who told her unseemly stories and who stood in the way of her vow, crying out in imprecation to them, Get away from me, you detestable purveyors of an oil which shall never anoint my head. Refusing all proposals of marriage, Yuta enters the Benedictine monastery at Disseboudenberg as an anchorite. Whether Hildegard has any choice in the matter, and whether or not this was all pre-planned by both sets of parents is unknown. But the young women consecrate themselves to the church together. Here is another passage from Guibert's biography. It describes the ritual that precedes the entombment of Jutta and Hildegard. According to the ritual of those laid to rest in the most solemn funeral liturgy with burning tapers, which warned her to go out with lamps alight to meet the bridegroom at his midnight coming, 
Yuta was interred by the abbot and brothers of the place as one literally dead to the world, together with her spiritual daughter Hildegard, then in her eighth year of age, and another handmaid of Christ of the same name, but of lower birth, her niece who was to minister to them. Crying out with all the longing of her heart, she said, This is my resting place forever. Here shall I dwell, for I have chosen it. And so with psalms and spiritual canticles, the three of them were enclosed in the name of the Most High Trinity. After the assembly had withdrawn, they were left in the hand of the Lord. Except for a rather small window through which visitors could speak at certain hours and necessary provision be passed across, all access was blocked off, not with wood, but with stones, solidly cemented in. Yuta and Hildegard's new home is a small hut adjacent to the monastery. Their family members and close friends were likely in attendance at the sealing-in ceremony, which is a funeral rite. Yuta and Hildegard are now dead to the mortal world. According to Guibert, Yuta's niece is also sealed in to act as a servant. Other sources mention a fourth girl, and it's unclear from Yuta's biography whether Uda, Yuta's tutor from Spanheim, is also sealed in. Far from being a solitary oblate or anchorite, Yuta and Hildegard are joined by at least one other, and their number grows. Yuta is a well-known aristocrat. Other aristocrats soon send their daughters to join the pious Yuta and Hildegard, each one bringing an allowance that enriches the monastery. But life is far from a sleepover. Their days and nights are a never-ending cycle of scheduled prayers and devotions, beginning at 2 a.m. with the 90-minute matins prayer, and culminating in the hour-long compline or night prayer at quarter past seven in the evening, followed immediately by bedtime. Free time is allocated to austerity in prayer, basic Latin instruction, sewing and embroidery for the monastery, and chores for the monks and for themselves that could be performed from within their cell. Highborn women like Yuta and her charges may have been exempt from this last duty. It's most likely Yuta's niece or the servant Uda attended to these menial tasks. According to author Fiona Maddox, Yuta plays a pivotal role in Hildegard's life. She teaches her younger charge how to read in order to understand and recite scripture. It's possible Hildegard also learns music from Yuta, in particular how to play the psaltery, a medieval stringed instrument. Perhaps most significantly, Yuta introduces Hildegard to a monk named Volmer. It's Volmer who would write Yuta's Vita and also become Hildegard's secretary. Despite Yuta's profound impact on Hildegard, it appears that the two weren't best friends. The older anchorite was extreme in her devotions. She insisted on standing barefoot through hours and hours of prayer, likely demanding the others follow her example. Yuta was also so extreme in her diet that the abbot of Disabonaburg ordered her to eat to save her life. Shortly before Yuta dies in 1136 at the age of 45, she expresses a wish to Hildegard and another nun to not allow her body to be, quote, openly uncovered for washing. In compliance with this last wish, Hildegard and the nun attend to Yuta's corpse alone. It's only then that they discover why Yuta had made the request in the first place. Among innumerable other marks of her passion, they discovered a chain which she had worn on her flesh had made three furrows right round her body. The word passion in the quote means suffering, in this case, self-harm or mortification. Based on later writings, we know Hildegard doesn't share Yuta's zeal for mortification. It's plausible that Yuta's example influences Hildegard to take a completely different approach to spirituality, one that focuses on health and cures. The two women were certainly methodologically opposed, but we don't know what they really thought of each other personally. Hildegard's reaction to Yuta's death might be an indication. According to her writings, the death of Hildegard's own mother elicited a deep sorrow. And so many tears did I shed, weeping and weeping, that my tears soaked all the bruises 
and all the pain from my wounds. The death of the monk Volmer also deeply affects Hildegard. She refers to him in a letter as her quote, only beloved son. On Yuta's death, Hildegard is completely silent. What's for certain is that Yuta's death is the best thing that could ever happen for Hildegard. Now in her early 40s, she takes over Yuta's duties as abbess. Not officially, though, never in fact. Hildegard would only ever remain magistra, although in practice, she's now in charge of 18 nuns at Disabonaburg, and she'll prove to be far more capable and prolific than any official abbess of her time, or any time. Soon after Yuta's death, the debilitating visions that Hildegard has kept secret since childhood intensify. When Hildegard is 42 years old, she receives a vision which is a command from God. As I was gazing with great fear and trembling attention at a heavenly vision, I saw a great splendor in which resounded a voice from heaven saying to me, O fragile human, ashes of ashes and filth of filth, say and write what you see and hear. Explain these things in such a way that the hearer receiving the words of his instructor may expound them in those words according to that will, vision, and instruction. Speak, therefore, of these wonders, and being so taught, write them and speak. Now commanded by God to reveal the visions she's been suppressing her entire life, Hildegard approaches Volmer, who's in the process of finishing Yuta's biography. Volmer believes Hildegard's visions to be true, and the two begin the task assigned to them from above. It takes 10 years to complete the first compilation of visions, entitled Skivios, which is often translated as Know the Way. Based on the artwork in Skivius, we know Hildegard likely dictates some of her thoughts to Volmer, whilst inscribing others with a stylus onto a wax tablet. Volmer then commits Hildegard's words to vellum, a parchment created from dried animal skin or membrane. Hildegard admits in Skivios to being in doctum, lacking formal education, her only training resulting from the tutelage of Yuta and perhaps Uda. So Volmer also edits Hildegard's work, affecting only the Latin grammar, never the content. Many others are certainly involved as well. Scribes to handle rubrication, the addition of red text for emphasis, monks and nuns who are artists, creating illuminations, the wondrous illustrations that show us exactly what Hildegard saw. And once everything else had been completed, someone to create the table of contents. We know the identity of one individual who helped Hildegard and Volmer, She's the daughter of the wealthy Countess of Stade in Saxony. She's the sister of Hartwig, the influential Archbishop of Bremen, and a distant cousin of Jutta's. The young nun is a noblewoman who's Hildegard's favorite. Her name is Richardis. Nearly everything we know about Richardis comes from letters between Hildegard and several people involved in an incident that would greatly affect the visionary magistra. First, let's set the scene. Hildegard's reputation is on the ascendancy. Years earlier, Volmer had revealed Hildegard's visions to Abbot Kuno, the head of the monastery at Disabodenburg. Kuno then escalated the matter to his superior, the Archbishop of Mainz, to either authenticate her as a mystic or expose her as a heretic. The matter was eventually brought to the attention of the Pope. Hildegard's fame was, for Abbot Kuno, both a blessing and a curse. On the one hand, her presence brought prestige to the monastery. On the other hand, Hildegard called all the shots. Without her, Abbot Kuno and his monastery were nothing. At the close of the Synod of Trier between November 1147 and February 1148, Pope Eugenius III endorses Hildegard's visionary work. This is at the urging of St. Bernard, a mystic discussed in a bonus episode, St. Bernard, the Marian mystic. Hildegard had written a letter to Bernard prior to the Synod, asking the fellow visionary for advice. The tone of the reply is a bit like a form letter. 
But he does conclude the correspondence blessing Hildegard's visions as a gift, and counsels her to, quote, respond eagerly to it with all humility. Bernard's foreknowledge of Hildegard and her visions helps the Synod and Pope Eugenius rule in her favor. Sometime between 1148 and 1150, when Hildegard is about 50 years old, Richardis' mother, the Countess, intervenes on behalf of Hildegard, who has a vision in which she's told to leave de Siboneburg and take her nuns with her. The well-connected Countess has a private audience with the Archbishop of Mainz. She persuades him to allow Hildegard to purchase land near the village of Bingen along the Rhine River. The property is called Rupertsburg, named after the locally revered St. Rupert. Abbot Kuno mounts a fierce objection to the move. He eventually concedes when Hildegard falls into a mysterious illness that strikes her blind and paralyzes her. Concerned he might be standing in the way of God's will, Abbot Kuno reluctantly grants permission for the move. Other versions of Hildegard's legend name Kuno himself as the victim of paralysis. At any rate, Hildegard and or Abbot Kuno miraculously recover once permission for the move is granted. Life at the new monastery in Rupertsburg is, to say the least, difficult. The ruined structure that's now Hildegard and her nun's new home is a building site, a pale, pale comparison to the well-appointed complex at Dissenbonaburg they've left behind. Abbot Kuno and his monks continue berating Hildegard with taunts, thinly veiled as heartfelt consolations for her predicament, and reminders of their eternal love for her, their sister, despite her poor treatment and abandonment of them, those who raised her. Even more damaging is Abbot Kuno's intransigence about one topic, Volmer. Although Hildegard's convent has moved, she and her nuns are still under Abbot Kuno's jurisdiction. Women weren't allowed to run monasteries on their own. They were also prohibited from saying mass. Only a priest, a man, was allowed to do this. Hildegard requests Volmer to be their priest and confessor at Rupertsburg. And of course, he's much more to Hildegard than just her favorite priest. Volmer is her secretary, her writing partner, her friend. Abbot Kuno's reply? Absolutely not. Hildegard's response is nothing short of nuclear. If some of you unworthy ones said to yourselves, let's take some of their freeholds away, then I who am say you are the worst of robbers. And if you try to take away that shepherd of spiritual medicine then again, I say you are the sons of Belial, and in this do not look to the justice of God. So that same justice will destroy you. Belial is a Hebrew word that denotes something worthless. Its meaning then morphed into wickedness, and by Hildegard's time, it was the name of a demon or the devil himself. The freeholds Hildegard accuses Abbot Kuno of taking away are land holdings donated by the Oblate's noble families, which are legally owned by Kuno's monastery. It takes quite a bit of haggling and many more nuclear letters for Hildegard to wrest back control of much of these assets with minimal concessions. Before that happens, however, it's a tough time at the new monastery, which consists of nothing more than a chapel in ruins and a few dilapidated farm buildings. As a result, a number of families decide to withdraw their daughters. Richardis is one of them. Hartwig, the Archbishop of Bremen, offers his sister the opportunity to become abbess of Bassum, a prestigious Benedictine monastery in her brother's diocese. It's about a five and a half hour drive from Rupertsburg today, days away in Hildegard's time. Hildegard's own account of how this affects her is in the preface to Scivias. For while I was writing the book Scivias, I bore a deep love for a certain noble young woman, daughter of the above-mentioned Marchioness, just as Paul loved Timothy. She joined herself to me in loving friendship in everything and comforted me in all my trials until at length I finished that book. 
But after this, because of the high station of her family, she inclined after the dignity of a higher title, so that she was named the mother of a certain very eminent community. She did not seek this, however, according to God, but according to this world's honour. Despite the cool tone of this passage, Richardus' departure grieves Hildegard bitterly. Nothing Hildegard does dissuades her favourite nun from leaving. She writes to Hartwig, warning him he's acting against God's will. She writes to Richardus' mother that the move can only foretell ill tidings. Hildegard even petitions Pope Eugenius, whose response, as author Fiona Maddox says, is extraordinary. Not only because he replies at all, but in the expertly crafted letter full of scriptural imagery that commands Hildegard to release Richardis immediately and to never bother him again. Hildegard ignores the papal decree, forcing her favorite nun to openly defy her and leave anyway. It's Hildegard's own letter to Richardis that reveals clues to Hildegard's true feelings. It begins with the line, Listen, daughter, to your spiritual mother. According to academic Maria Eugenia Gongoria, the opening is a reference to Psalm 44, a reminder to reject earthly ambitions for heavenly rewards. This is a line that Richardis and everyone in Hildegard's orbit would have been familiar with. Much of medieval correspondence was structured in this way, using verses from scripture to provide additional layers of meaning. In the case of Listen, Daughter, the subtext is a reprimand for Richardus' decision to choose the earthly promotion to an abbess at the expense of the heavenly rewards she would reap with Hildegard at Rupertsburg. This, of course, implies Rupertsburg is heaven and Hildegard is God. The end of the letter is so heartfelt, the sorrow of someone heartbroken. Here it is, the last three sections. Now I tell you again, woe is me, mother. Woe to me, daughter. Why have you forsaken me and left me an orphan? I loved the nobility of your character, your wisdom and your chastity, and your spirit and whole being, to the point that many told me, what are you doing? Now cry with me all those who suffer a pain similar to mine who felt an affection in their heart and soul as great as the one I have felt for you, for a person who was taken from them in an instant, as you were for me. But may the angel of God guide you, and may the Son of God protect you, and may his mother keep you. Remember your poor mother, Hildegard. May happiness not abandon you. The line, Why have you forsaken me, appears in the Gospels of both Mark and Matthew. It describes Christ's moment of human doubt before dying on the cross. Hildegard compares her own suffering to the suffering of Christ. The letter to Richardis is arguably Hildegard at her most vulnerable. Her writing is often passionate and emotional, as we've seen in her retort to Abbot Kuno. But there's something impersonal about them. She writes either as a mouthpiece of God, or, shockingly, as God, and she only ever refers to herself as an unworthy emissary. What sets apart the letter to Richardis from all other surviving texts is that Hildegard uses her own name. Remember your poor mother, Hildegard. Any conclusions we draw about the nature of Hildegard and Richardis' relationship are speculation. There's only circumstantial evidence to suggest a connection beyond a professional closeness between a magistra and her nun, an author and her illustrator. A romantic link between Hildegard and Vollmer has also been suggested. Evidence for this pairing is very, very scant. If there were anything going on between these two, 
it was likely Volmer who had feelings for Hildegard. Reading between the lines of Hildegard's impassioned letter to Richardis, I imagine a magistra in love with her protégé, and a protégé who loved her mentor in return. Who wouldn't be enthralled by someone like Hildegard, even if, like Abbot Kuno and other men in power, you were also frightened of her, jealous as well? Hildegard's mere existence as a 12th century woman who didn't behave in the manner a 12th century woman ought to was in itself a threat and polarized opinion, then and now. I wonder about Richardis. What were the reasons that led her to leave Rupertsburg? Perhaps it wasn't easy being the sole object of Hildegard's affection, the focus of someone so forceful who was also your master in all aspects of your life every minute of every day, every year. I wonder if Richardis dreamed of another life for herself after working so closely and intensely with Hildegard and Volmer on Scivias. Her brother, the Archbishop Hartwig, provides an escape route. Is it an escape route Richardis asked him to provide? And even though the new post as an abbess, a title Hildegard would never attain for herself, promised a new life in which Richardis would be her own master, she only departs after her work on Scivias was completed. Is this because of her sense of Christian duty, or is it because of a deep affection for Hildegard? Most likely, we'll never know. Hildegard doesn't allow the agony over losing Richardis stop her from making the new convent at Rupertsburg a massive success. New buildings, gardens, and sacred spaces are designed and built. New oblates and anchorites arrive to more than replace the number that had left. And eventually, Abbot Kuno relents. Volmer is released and journeys to Rupertsburg. Reunited, Hildegard and her secretary then embark on new publications. In 1152, about two years after Richardis departs, Hildegard receives a letter from Archbishop Hartwig. I write to inform you that our sister, my sister in body but yours in spirit, has gone the way of all flesh, little esteeming that honour I bestowed upon her. I'm happy to report that she made her last confession in a saintly and pious way. Moreover, filled with her usual Christian spirit, she tearfully expressed longing for your cloister with her whole heart. Hartwig's letter indicates the 29th of October as the date of his sister's death. He begs Hildegard to forgive him for taking her away. Then he thanks the magistra for, quote, All the good things you did for her, you alone, more even than relatives or friends. Hartwig admits both he and his sister realized Hildegard was right. Richardis's move from Rupertsburg was a mistake. Hildegard's reply to Hartwig is full of the over-the-top scriptural imagery that she was so masterful at crafting. Its imperious tone carries within it a pointed subtext. Although the world loved her physical beauty and her worldly wisdom while she was still alive, my soul has the greatest confidence in her salvation, for God loves her more. Therefore, he was unwilling to give his beloved to a heartless lover, that is, the world. Now you, dear Hartwig, you who sit as Christ's representative, fulfill the desire of your sister's soul as obedience demands. And just as she always had your interests at heart, so you now take thought for her soul and do good works as she wished. Now, as for me, I cast out in my heart that grief you caused me in the matter of this, my daughter. May God grant you, through the prayers of saints, the due of grace and reward in the world to come. To summarize, I told you so. I wonder how Hildegard reacted to Hartwig's letter in private. Did she weep for Richardis as she did for her mother? Did she have any regrets? Or did she feel vindicated by God? In the decades following Richardis' death, Hildegard creates two additional visionary texts, 
three tomes on natural history and healing, a musical morality play, two hagiographies, three shorter commentaries on dogma, a secret language with 900 invented words, numerous letters, and 70 musical compositions. Amidst this outpouring of creativity and productivity, Hildegard also founds a second monastery to house an ever-flowing stream of wealthy oblates and anchorites begging to join her with their dowries in tow. She spends two days every week at the new monastery in Ibingen, a village just across the river from the Rupertsburg. The year is 1165. Hildegard is in her late 60s and has spent the good part of the decade traveling and preaching despite strict rules against preaching by women. The prohibition has its roots from a letter or epistle attributed to St. Paul. Quote, A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or have authority over a man. She must be silent. In her excellent biography, Fiona Maddox postulates that Hildegard's fame may have persuaded the authorities to bend the rules and not only allow, but invite her to preach. Hildegard is a celebrity, known not just locally in the Rhine region of Germany, but further afield in France, England, Italy, and likely beyond. Throughout her life, Hildegard maintains correspondence with an impressive list of princes, church officials, and laypersons. One such pen pal is the fellow oblate and mystic Elizabeth of Schonau, who becomes Hildegard's protege of sorts. We met Elizabeth of Schonau in the Martyrs episode about St. Ursula. It was Elizabeth who confirmed the identity of the bones sent to her by monks in Cologne as those of the 11,000 virgins martyred with St. Ursula. Like Hildegard, Elizabeth is tormented by painful visions of the divine, but they're different. Academic and author Sabina Flanagan compares Hildegard's visions to, quote, images projected on a screen. What Hildegard sees is easily discernible from the physical reality around her. For Elizabeth, this distinction isn't so clear. Here is a passage from Flanagan's book, Hildegard of Bingen, A Visionary Life, that describes Elizabeth's visions. Sometimes, indeed, she is doubtful about the source of the vision, as in the case of a dove which she fears might be a diabolical manifestation. She is reassured when it perches on a crucifix, since she knows that a devil would flee its presence. This account also shows how, in Elizabeth's case, the apparitions occupy the same physical space as the seer, and indeed interact with real objects. Sometime in the 1150s, Elizabeth, who's now in her mid-twenties, has a vision in which an angel appears and leads her to a tent. Inside is a pile of books. Scivias sits at the very top. Inspired by the vision, Elizabeth makes a trip to Rupertsburg to meet Hildegard. Hildegard becomes Elizabeth's confidant. In deferential letters, the younger mystic writes to the older, and it seems, more confident visionary. Elizabeth details the suffering that accompanies her visions. The physical pain, as well as the malice in every word and look from her peers, who are incredulous and jealous. Hildegard's replies are on a typically imperious tone, but she seems to have real empathy for Elizabeth, whom she calls daughter, and proves to be a great relief and role model for the younger nun. Elizabeth also has an impact on Hildegard. It's possible the younger nun is the inspiration behind Hildegard's 13 compositions in honor of St. Ursula and her 11,000 virgins. Elizabeth's visions are eventually published with help from her brother, Eckbert. And if the number of surviving copies of her books is any indication, it seems that she becomes even more popular than Hildegard. But her popularity doesn't last, and she's largely unknown today. We'll explore the story of Elizabeth of Schonau in the next bonus episode. Hildegard continues her preaching tour as her writings are copied, studied, and shared. Her arrival at communities up and down the Rhine sees throngs of pilgrims flocking to her boat as it docks. Many miracles are attributed to her. Bread, blessed by the visionary, relieves the uncontrollable lust a high-born woman harbors for a handsome laborer. 
Amulets and charms made from Hildegard's hair and items she's touched affect impossible cures. A demoniac named Siegeweise is famously exorcised with Hildegard's help, then lives out her life with the nuns at Rupertsburg. Hildegard's fame is at its peak. Not everyone is a fan, though. One critic is the writer of a letter that academic Honey McConey rightly calls deliciously snide. It's from a woman named Texvind, an Augustinian canoness in nearby Andernach. She writes Hildegard to warn of vicious rumors that have shocked her. They can't possibly be true, can they? On feast days, your virgins stand in the church with unbound hair when singing the psalms, and that as part of their dress they wear white silk veils so long that they touch the floor. Moreover, it is said that they wear crowns of gold filigree, into which are secured crosses on both sides and the back, with a figure of the lamb at the front, and that they adorn their fingers with golden rings. Moreover, that which seems no less strange to us is the fact that you admit into your community only those women from noble, well-established families, and absolutely reject others who are of lower birth and less wealth. The criticism that Hildegard's convent is a private members club for rich girls is shared by others. Her friend, the monk and hagiographer Guibert of Jean Bleu, asks a similar question. Is it by divine revelation or merely for the sake of ornamentation that you have your virgins wear crowns? And further, how are we to interpret the distinctions among the various crowns? For we have heard that they are not all the same. In response to Texvin's queries, Hildegard states that since her charges are virgins, cloistered and unmarried, they have no need to hide their beauty, a God-given reflection of their purity. To Guibert, she answers that the crowns came to her in a vision. Indeed, diadems, crowns, and long lustrous hair are present in the illustrations of many female figures from Scivios. According to Hildegard, the accessories worn by her nuns accentuate God's gifts to them. The rules of St. Benedict, which guide Hildegard's monastery, would beg to differ. They're quite clear that anything beyond two tunics and sandals appropriate for the local climate is a superfluous excess and forbidden. As for Texvin's criticism on the classist nature of the monastery, here's a passage from Scivios that reveals Hildegard's views. God also keeps a watchful eye on every person, so that a lower order will not gain ascendancy over a higher one, as Satan and the first man did, who wanted to fly higher than they had been placed. And who would gather all his livestock indiscriminately into one barn, the cattle, the asses, the sheep, the kids? Thus it is clear that differentiation must be maintained in these matters, lest people of varying status, herded all together, be dispersed through the pride of their elevation on the one hand, or the disgrace of their decline on the other, and especially lest the nobility of their character be torn asunder when they slaughter one another out of hatred. Such destruction naturally results when the higher order falls upon the lower, and the lower rises above the higher. For God establishes ranks on earth, just as in heaven, with angels, archangels, thrones, dominions, cherubim and seraphim, and they are all loved by God, although they are not equal in rank. For many mainstream Christians of the 12th century, wealth and status were justified as God's will. Hildegard would have accepted this as a truth, one reinforced by her life as a Benedictine a monastic order that, in the 6th century since its founding, had become an order of aristocrats who embraced the advantages of amassing wealth. Texvind and Augustinian wouldn't have shared this philosophy. In the next 50 years, reform movements would see the founding of the Franciscan and Dominican orders and a rejection of material wealth. Like St. Bernard, Hildegard is one of the more conservative voices in the 12th century. She joins Bernard in an inflexible stance against the Cathars. Whilst preaching in Cologne in 1163, 
Hildegard gives a rousing sermon that anyone espousing Cathar beliefs will suffer God's eternal damnation. We discussed the Cathars in more detail in the last Mystics episode, St. Peter of Verona, the Exorcist. The Cathars were radicals. Capital punishment and killing of all kinds was abhorrent. Many were vegetarians. They focused on the spiritual rather than the material or physical, eschewing wealth and earthly pleasures. Many women found Catharism attractive because they were allowed to hold positions of power and preach. Hildegard was not one of these women. Hildegard is equally conservative in her views on gender and sex. Her visions reinforce the superiority of men over women. The vast majority of Christians would have shared her views on gender. Likewise, Hildegard and her contemporaries were anti-Semitic. Jews, Cathars, Muslims, Eastern Christians, anyone who didn't follow the teachings of the mainstream church in Rome was a heretic. A handful of Hildegard's biographers point out that modern interest in Hildegard has its roots during the celebrations in Germany of the 750th anniversary of her death. This was in 1929. Hildegard's story and image would be appropriated by nationalists to represent a German identity, despite the fact that the modern idea of Germany didn't exist in Hildegard's lifetime and wouldn't for centuries. Hildegard views homosexuality as a sin, but she has a slightly different take on same-sex relationships between women than between men. A man who, quote, sins with another man as if with another woman, sins bitterly against God. Hildegard calls their union polluted, black and wanton, horrible and harmful to God and humanity, and guilty of death. When a woman loves another woman, Hildegard says it is, quote, most vile in my sight. The sin born from two women together isn't just an affront to God like two men. It's an offense to her personally. She continues, quote, For they should have been ashamed of their passion, and instead they impudently usurped a right that was not theirs. These lines are from a letter Hildegard writes to an abbot in 1153. I can't help wondering if these are her personal beliefs rather than divine visions, opinions she formed through experience and honed by heartbreak. The politics of 12th century Europe troubles Hildegard greatly. In short, it's a power struggle between Frederick I, the Holy Roman Emperor, who's Hildegard's king, and the church in Rome, whose head, the Pope, is Hildegard's spiritual leader. Frederick backs a series of anti-popes, men who claim the position as Pope, but are not recognized by officials in Rome. Frederick is at first a supporter of Hildegard's. He safeguards her monastery at Rupertsburg and even invites her to the palace early on in their acquaintance. Unfortunately, no records from this meeting have survived. Once Frederick begins supporting the anti-popes, however, Hildegard's allegiance shifts to the popes elected by the cardinals. She writes a fiery letter of admonishment to Frederick. He never replies. In 1170, a 72-year-old Hildegard leaves Rupertsburg for what will be her last trip. The ever-faithful Volmer is worried and writes after her health. It's the only surviving letter from Volmer to Hildegard. Even if, O oh sweetest mother, we should see you daily with our eyes of flesh, hear you daily with our ears of flesh, and, as is just, daily cleave devotedly to you, understanding that the Holy Spirit speaks to us through you, we still do not doubt that your absence, which we cannot mention without tears, shall one day really weigh upon us, when, as it pleases God, we shall not see you henceforth. Vollmer's affection for his boss and friend is clear. Luckily for him, he's protected from the grief of Hildegard's death. In 1173, Volmer dies. Gone is Hildegard's faithful companion, secretary, assistant, friend, and in her own words, her, quote, only son. To make matters worse, Volmer's death results in another row with the monks at Dissenbodenberg. 
Though Abbot Kuno has long since passed, his successor, Hellinger, proves equally antagonistic. He refuses to replace Vollmer, meaning no one at Rupertsburg can receive communion, mass, or any of the sacraments. Abbot Hellinger receives a scathing letter. Sometimes you are like a bear which growls under its breath, but sometimes like an ass, not prudent, but rather worn down. In some matters, you are altogether useless. But when you do get a flash of insight, you pray for a little while, and then you grow weary again, and you do not even bother to finish your prayers. There's no way Abbot Hellinger can win this battle. Hildegard appeals to Alexander III, the official pope recognized by Rome, who appoints her brother as provost at St. Andreas College in Cologne. This means Hildegard's brother is now in charge of replacing Vollmer. Hellinger has been outplayed. Hildegard has one last hurdle to face. In 1179, the clergy at Mainz issues an interdict, forbidding mass and forbidding the divine hours from being sung at Rupertsburg. They do this while the archbishop Christian is away, helping to reconcile Emperor Frederick with Pope Alexander. The interdict is likely personal in nature and disguised as the ruling over the burial of a heretic at Rupertsburg. Burials of wealthy patrons were a major source of income for monasteries. The man in question, whose identity has been lost, had been excommunicated and thus should not have been buried on consecrated ground. The interdict proves disastrous for Rupertsburg. Hildegard, now aged 80 or 81, writes a letter to the Mainz clergy and two letters to Archbishop Christian, who's still in Rome. In these letters, she explains how the man had been accepted back into the church, a fact confirmed by visions and also easily corroborated by eyewitnesses to the reconciliation. Hildegard describes at length how important music is to God, something we'll explore shortly, and she characterizes the battle between Mainz and Rupertsburg as one between, quote, upright men and feminine harshness. The true meaning behind these phrases is the opposite of the definitions of the words. The upright men are the vindictive prelates of Mainz. The harsh feminine players are the godly Hildegard and her nuns, protecting the dying wishes of a good Christian man. As you can probably guess, Archbishop Christian sides with Hildegard. Hildegard emerges victorious once again in what would prove to be her last and final battle. In September of 1179, Hildegard, aged 81, dies of an undisclosed illness. According to the hagiography by her friend Guibert, two multicolored rainbows arc in the sky upon Hildegard's last breath. The full moon appears and shines at the intersection of the rainbows, illuminating the sky. Suddenly, a red cross appears overhead, it grows to an immense size and is joined by countless smaller crosses, each one bending towards Hildegard's dead body in mourning for the great visionary. Hildegard's music has increased in popularity in the last decade. About 70 religious compositions, plus a musical morality play called Ordo Virtutum, have survived. Together, the musical pieces are called Symphonia. The individual works vary by length, and were composed by Hildegard to be sung during various scheduled prayers that make up each day in a monastery. We have a basic idea of how the pieces were meant to be sung, but it's not so clear what particular day or time of day they were meant to be sung. The songs are all examples of the plain chant tradition, melodies without regular rhythm, repeating refrains, or harmony. The songs are also melismatic, meaning single syllables are often sung to many notes. Accompaniment is up to the musicians. Any available instrument will do. Here's a short example of one of Hildegard's pieces. It's called Sed Diabolus.
The title of this piece has been translated to But the Devil Mocked, or Only the Devil Laughed. The Latin text is a warning that the devil makes a mockery of all of God's creations. Hildegard's collected musical works cover a range of liturgical topics, from the devil to the Virgin Mary and Christ, the Holy Spirit, angels, the apostles. There are songs dedicated to saints of Hildegard's Rhineland home, Ursula, Disabod, and Rupert. Much of the imagery in Hildegard's music is feminine and aristocratic. When hearing her music, I imagine Hildegard's high-born nuns, bedecked in bejeweled ornament and fine veils, of the kind Texviant certainly wouldn't approve of. They're surrounded by an eruption of colorful flowers and ripe fruits, while celestial figures listen approvingly from the heavens. The morality play Ordo Virtutum, Order of the Virtues, was composed around the year 1151, about the same time Hildegard uprooted her nuns to Rupertsburg. Ordo Virtutum is the earliest surviving morality play. The plot centers around a battle between the devil and the virtues for possession of a soul. The virtues are personified by female figures, which also appear in Hildegard's visions. We'll explore these allegorical figures a little later. The soul is also a female figure. She appears in part two of the play and desires to bypass a mortal life to enter heaven immediately. The virtues counsel the soul that she must endure the trials and tribulations of a human life first in order to judge her worthiness for heaven. This is the devil's chance to seduce the soul with temptations. Ordo Virtutum's epilogue, sung by the virtues, is a noteworthy piece. The flower of the field falls before the wind. The rain scatters its petals. O oh, virginity, you abide forever in the chorus of the company of heaven. Hence you are a tender flower that shall never fade. Scholar, author, and Hildegard expert Barbara Newman reads the epilogue as a memorial to Hildegard's beloved Richardis. Hildegard has a special regard for music. Her defense of the monastery when officials from Mainz prevented singing at Rupertsburg lays bare her reverence for song. Men of zeal and wisdom have imitated the holy prophets and have themselves with human skill invented several his kinds of musical instruments so that they might be able to sing for the delight of their souls. And they accompanied their singing with instruments played with the flexing of the fingers, recalling in this way Adam, who was formed by God's fingers, which is the Holy Spirit. For before he sinned, his voice had the sweetness of all musical harmony. Indeed, if he had remained in his original state, the weakness of mortal man would not have been able to endure the power and the shrill resonance of his voice. Therefore, those who, without just cause, impose silence on a church and prohibit the singing of God's praises will lose their place among the chorus of angels, unless they have amended their lives through true penitence and humble restitution. For Hildegard, Music is a gift from God to unworthy mortals. In preventing Hildegard and her nuns from singing, the prelates of minds work against God's natural order. Hildegard of Bingen's most studied works are her compilations of visions. Scivias, composed between 1142 and 1151, Liber Vitae Meritorum, or Book of Life's Merits, from 1158 to 63, and Liber Divinorum Operum, or Book of Divine Works, created sometime between 1163 to 73. Together, they comprise a treasure trove of Hildegard's theological thoughts, transmitted through visions of the living light. They cover everything from the very nature of salvation through the minutiae of proper behavior for clergy and laypersons. There's so much to say about these works. I'm going to focus on Hildegard's treatment of women what Barbara Newman calls The Theology of the Feminine, the subtitle of her brilliant book, Sister of Wisdom. We'll explore Hildegard's compilations of visions by examining the reoccurring female figures that appear in them. 
The first female figure in Scivios is named Synagogue, a woman who has the prophets of the Old Testament in her womb, Abraham in her heart, Moses in her bosom. She's blind and pallid, her hands are useless, tucked under her armpits. The woman has bright red feet, surrounded by a cloud. Synagogue represents the Jewish faith, the foundation for Christianity. The redness on her feet is the stain of blood incurred from killing Christ, a Christian sentiment that Jews are to blame for Christ's death. The cloud is a precursor to the next female figure who succeeds Synagogue. Her name is Ecclesia, the Church, the mainstream Christian church that emerged from Judaism. The Church, Bride of Christ, is like a city. Unlike the synagogue, she stands before the altar and before the eyes of God with her arms touching and embracing the altar and the groom. The crown that adorns her head represents the apostles and martyrs that have adorned her since the beginning. The splendour of her sleeves is that of the purest light joining earth and heaven that manifests the strength of the actions of the priests. She is covered in splendour and she does not yet have legs nor feet because she has not yet reached perfection and the final battle with the Antichrist is still looming. They will be revealed after the end times. This description of Ecclesia comes from Sarah Salvadori's book Hildegard von Bingen, A Journey into the Images, which reproduces in full color the copies made by nuns of the original illustrations that accompanied Scivias. Sadly, the originals were lost after World War II. Smaller female figures in Scivias personify virtues such as patience, mercy, modesty, obedience. Also more esoteric concepts like the love of heaven, the science of God, God's justice, desire for heaven. These mirror the allegorical figures from the morality play we just looked at. One of these is the personification of virginity, virginitas, often interpreted as a portrait of Rihardis. Two more major female figures are found in the Book of Divine Works, Sapientia and Caritas. Sapientia is the personification of wisdom from the Old Testament, with roots in ancient Greek philosophy. She's been described as the consort of Jesus Christ, and often given the name Sophia. The Hagia Sophia in Istanbul is dedicated to this figure. Caritas is divine love, sometimes translated as charity, but the meaning in Hildegard's visions isn't about volunteering your time and doing good deeds. Caritas embodies an altruistic love that inspires such charitable acts. Head to St. Podcast's website to have a look at some of these illustrations. They're really very cool. Hildegard's visions place femininity at the pinnacle of holiness, not because they're better than men, but because they're inferior. Hildegard's exaltation of her inferiority stems from the Bible, Corinthians chapter 12, verse 10 in which St. Paul writes, quote, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul isn't referring to women when he mentions weakness, but Hildegard takes the sentiment to heart. She refers often to her own second-rate status as a woman as the calling that compels her to be God's vessel. Hildegard called her age of cultural and political upheaval a womanish time, in which the traditional seats of power, men, had been weakened, emasculated. It's a time in which, quoting Hildegard, God's justice is exerting itself, a female warrior battling against injustice. Hildegard sees herself as this female warrior, God's justice in the guise of a woman, in a time when the men are powerless to do anything. This is radical. Hildegard isn't censured, however, because she isn't radical at all. Despite the central role that women and female figures play in her visions and daily life, Hildegard never takes the next step to promote the feminine as anything but weak. Barbara Newman summarizes this very elegantly in Sister of Wisdom. Hildegard drew no such alarming inferences. 
She was resourceful enough in defending her own activity and authority, but she certainly did not aim at a full-scale empowerment of women. Hildegard was extraordinary. She wielded power and influence that few men of her time had, and all through her own sheer force of personality, wit, and will. Hildegard herself would likely cite another quality that allowed her such success. She remained a virgin all her life. To Hildegard, sex was sin, though admittedly a necessary one for procreation. Despite Hildegard's reactionary views on sex, which weren't shared by all her contemporaries, she had a lot of knowledge about sex, revealed in two scientific works. They're secular in nature, probably based on first-hand experience and perhaps the collected knowledge of the people and references within Hildegard's sphere. The two volumes are Physica, a nine-book collection of the medicinal properties of animals, plants, and elements. And secondly, Causae et Curae, Causes and Cures, what is today a six-book set that explores the human body and a range of medicinal causes and cures, and also cosmology. Neither work is entirely divorced from religion, which formed the foundation for nearly all knowledge of Hildegard's time. To modern sensibilities, the books read like magical tomes or grimoires, whose cures are like spells, employing what Barbara Newman describes as, quote, an enormous number of items, ranging from rye bread and beer to elephants to rubies. In Hildegard's books, human behavior and health are divided into the medieval humors. All forms of matter have additional qualities and combinations of being either hot, dry, moist, and cold. Mixtures of plants, gemstones, animals, which include magical creatures like unicorns and dragons, influence these foundational properties to effect a cure. For example, Hildegard's solution for a hangover is to dunk a, quote, little bitch in water, then use the water to bathe the head of the hungover patient. An antidote for jaundice is the disturbing imprisonment of a stunned bat, tied firstly to the back of the sufferer, then to the stomach until the bat dies. This all said, Hildegard's works are groundbreaking documents of medical practices and the development of a scientific method. Many of the entries form the foundation of modern cures. It's within these two books that we get a very straight-talking treatment of sex. Hildegard's understanding of the mechanics and anatomy shows a remarkable familiarity with an act she never performed. The knowledge likely comes from treating, consoling, and absolving the pilgrims who sought her help with a variety of ailments, including those related to sex. Despite viewing sex as a sin, Hildegard's coverage on all aspects is completely non-judgmental. The science, however, is sometimes suspect. A contradictory mix of medieval Christian and pre-Christian beliefs, linking the strength of semen and temperament of the parents with the sex and personality of the child. The phases of the moon also play an important role to predetermine the qualities of the offspring. And in a surprisingly contradictory passage, Hildegard describes how it's in the nature of virginal women to resist the lustful advances of men. This negates an age-old tenant, and one she reinforces elsewhere, that women are far more susceptible to carnal sin than men. It took 833 years for Hildegard to officially become a saint. On the 10th of May in 2012, Pope Benedict XVI extended her sainthood beyond the Rhine Valley region to the entirety of the Catholic Church. Then, on the 7th of October of the same year, Benedict proclaimed Hildegard a doctor of the church, one of only four women among a total of 37 people recognized for their contributions to Catholic theology. Benedict deemed her, quote, perennially relevant, an authentic teacher of theology, and a profound scholar of natural science and music. Hildegard's growing popularity today is tied to her extraordinary achievements as a polymath, even more impressive because her accomplishments were won whilst adeptly circumventing the rules that restricted women and successfully seeing off all the powerful men who stood in her way.
Saint Hildegard of Bingen is fascinating because she's a contradiction. A reactionary cleric who published and disseminated detailed information about sex. A trailblazer who challenged gender roles by her own example whilst reinforcing them in almost every other way. I'd like to end this episode by highlighting a series of treatments found in Hildegard's medical writings. These are for the retention of the menzies, a medieval euphemism for an abortion. The methods vary from eating specific combinations of herbs prepared in a very specific manner, to immersing the belly in a bath infused with various botanical ingredients that are all known to modern science as abortifacients, compounds that induce abortions. Just as Hildegard detailed sex in her books, an act she believed was evil, but sometimes necessary, she doesn't omit methods to end unwanted pregnancies. The main concern for this saint and doctor of the church was the care of her flock, the nuns whom she mentored, the laypersons who journeyed sometimes vast distances to seek her help. The inclusion of treatments to retain the menzies in Hildegard's widely circulated medical books makes it clear they were not prohibited. In the hands of the reader, St. Hildegard of Bingen's medical publications have always provided options to manage a variety of ailments, a personal choice to treat any condition. Thank you so much for listening to the third episode in our season about mystics. If you enjoy our show, please support us on Patreon or Spotify. Your patronage will help keep St. Podcast going, as well as give you access to bonus episodes and a behind-the-scenes peek at what we do. For images of the artworks, people, and topics mentioned, have a look at the St. Podcast website at www.saintpodcast.com. The word saint is spelled out, S-A-I-N-T. Feel free to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for updates. And please email us at feedback at saintpodcast.com if you have comments, questions, or suggestions for future episodes. Amy Vanacore composed the background music and musical interludes for this episode. The first interlude contains the melody from Hildegard of Bingen's Responsory for the Virgin, composed to be sung over the word Maria. Clara Grun composed the accompaniment for Hildegard of Bingen's Sed Diabolus, which was sung by both Amy and Clara. Tanya Donald provided the readings in this episode. Tanya is the presenter of Tengi Talks TV and Movies on YouTube. There's a link to her channel on the Saint Podcast website. The next episode in Season 2, Mystics, is about a saint who was born shortly after Hildegard's death. A wealthy party boy drawn to sex, drugs, and rock and roll in his youth, this Italian cleric reformed his ways and founded a powerful monastic order that bears his name. His deep love for animals is well known and makes him the patron saint of animals, as well as nature and ecology. Most depictions of this saint in art show him in supplication before a crucified seraph, a six-winged angel nailed to a cross who floats in the air whilst burning Christ's wounds from the crucifixion into his body. This is the story of St. Francis of Assisi, the wayward stigmatic. Mm -hmm.